as Britain hands over control of Basra to Iraqi security forces, what are we leaving behind? Women are being brutally killed for being improperly dressed. There's torture and ethnic cleansing, and thousands of people who work for us risk being murdered. Why did they come? Why? Tony Blair promised to bring the people of Basra stability and security, but what are we really leaving behind? In a report that pulls no punches, Jane Corbyn reveals the true legacy Britain is leaving the people of Basra. Despite the bravery and sacrifice of our armed forces, the city and its inhabitants have been left facing an uncertain future. Basra, for centuries one of the great trading cities of the Middle East. After almost five years of war and occupation by the British, it's still a bustling place, home to nearly two million people. But you only need to check out the graffiti to see there's a dark side to Basra. Beware of using makeup and prettifying yourselves, the signs say. You will be punished for it. God is our witness that you have been warned. The threats are posted by a group calling itself the Organization Ordering an End to Abomination. Just one of many criminal gangs that terrorize ordinary people here. And these are no empty threats, as one woman from Basra told me. We can't show her face. It would put her life at risk. Since democracy, as you call it, came, Women wearing clothes with bright patterns are being killed in the streets. When the British were in control, women weren't killed. They could go out dressed as they liked. The Basra police showed us records of 47 brutal murders of women in the past few months. They've never been seen publicly before. And what crime deserves hideous mutilation and death? Not dressing modestly enough offending the so-called moral guardians of this city. When a woman is murdered, a corpse is thrown into the streets. They write notes on her body that she was an adulteress or some other excuse. Sometimes they put shameful clothes on her after she has been killed prove she was without honor, as we say in our society. Some women have been slaughtered in front of their children. And sometimes children who were with them have been murdered. For months I'd been hearing rumors of terrible things happening here, and I wanted to investigate. But the British Army had withdrawn to their camp 12 miles outside Basra. The threat of kidnap for journalists was high and I could no longer enter the city where I'd once worked freely. This is the road that leads from the British military base down to Basra city. But I can't go there now. It's just too dangerous for a Western journalist. But Panorama has found dedicated local people who, despite the risks, are prepared to help us build a picture of what's going on down in Basra. Some people have filmed for us collected information, written diaries about life in the city. We'd had to protect the identities of most of them for fear of reprisals. One woman emailed me about the dark forces in Basra. I've had several warnings, including a death threat and a threat to kidnap my son. Every morning they find bodies in the rubbish bins. There have been several murders of women by masked groups who I think have some sort of relationship with the police, since they use unmarked police cars. So who are these masked men with close links to the police? Everyone here says the same, the Shia militias. Panorama got in touch with Sheikh Bahadli, the leader of the Mahdi army, the most powerful of these groups, to ask about the killing of women. He said it was all exaggerated, just a tribal matter, but he did have a message for the ladies of Basra. 
Where do you find jewelry? In a big glass display case because it's valuable. Islam sees women as our most precious jewels. We protect them from prying eyes in a case made of cloth, the hijab, so they don't get damaged. Some aspects of life are better now in Iraq's second city, neglected and repressed by Saddam for so long. There's clean water and more electricity than before, though still not enough. There have been free elections, schools and universities are full. Yet without security, people's lives won't really improve. In Basra's hospitals, there are long queues and harassed staff, just like anywhere. But here, doctors are targets. Many doctors have been kidnapped. This year alone, at least 10 have been taken by gangs and then released after they pay a ransom. Just last month, a doctor was kidnapped by people using a government car. A government car. He was only released after he paid out $20,000. So there's no security. And everyone is thinking about leaving the city. The militias have infiltrated the security forces and the local council. They're the real power in the city. You find their propaganda everywhere. They're the armed wings of political parties elected to power in the new democracy Britain and America brought to Iraq. Now the British are bowing out, handing over Basra and its problems to the Iraqis. If the British exit strategy from southern Iraq is going to work, then Iraqi security forces have got to keep this part of the country controlled. And I'm on my way now to see the one man on whose shoulders that all rests. I was off to meet the Iraqi general, who's now the new military power in Basra. The British army drove me across the desert to his new headquarters. An experienced army officer, General Mohan's been imposed on the city by the Baghdad government to tackle the militias. And it won't just be an exercise like the one staged here. The general blames the British for the militia's strength. Could the British have fought against the militias earlier? Would the situation be better if they'd done that? Certainly, because the militias weren't strong enough then. They appeared after the collapse of Saddam's regime, not before. They weren't really organized. They were just some small groups which were only able to become powerful because of the absence of the Iraqi state and the lack of preventative action by the British. The Shia militias first flexed their muscles a year after the invasion. Further north, American troops took them on. But the British army lacked the manpower and the political will back home. Soon the militias began cleansing southern Iraq, first hounding out the alcohol sellers. Though mainly Shia, Basra had always been famous for its tolerance. But now Sunnis, Christians and other minorities began to fear for their lives. So did those who opposed corruption. Tarub al husband, Hazm, grew up in Basra. The couple met almost 30 years ago as students in London. After Saddam was toppled, they went back to Basra to help rebuild Hazm's city. He always told me, I want to make Basra a little, another Venice. Basra is going to be the Venice of the Middle East. And he really had high, high hopes for Basra. He loved it. But Hazm, now an official in the provincial council, soon became a target. Somebody came for him to sign a piece of paper for him or a plea or something. And he found it, that it was not proper. When he refused to do it, this man just got hold of a grenade, hand grenade, and he told him, you either sign or I would throw this grenade. 